have some interview with you pertaining your visit to France. Now, first of all, what brought you to France? Well, thank you very much for having me on your station. And it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I was invited by Minister Laurent Fabio to have a meeting with him to discuss matters that are relating to the bilateral relationship between Ghana and France. Since I became foreign minister, this is the second time that um, he has invited me. And on each occasion, we've had the opportunity to discuss a number of issues. This year, it was not just about um, Ghana and France, because there are a number of issues going on in the West Africa region at the present time. But also because Ghana is chair of ECOWAS, I am chair of the Council of Ministers of ECOWAS. Okay. And so in that context, we had a broad discussion over a number of issues pertaining to West Africa and also to Ghana. Well, can you elaborate to us some of the issues that you discussed with the French uh, Foreign Minister? I can, but if you don't mind, let me just expand a little bit further. In okay. addition to um, being invited by him, I thought it was also an opportunity to engage with the French business community that has invested in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to meet with representatives from MEDEF, Medef. and also from uh, SIAN. SIAN, okay. SIAN is the Council of uh, Investors, Council of um, People Who Have Invested in Africa. In Africa, okay. And so I've, I had two meetings with them um, as well. As well. And then I also had the opportunity last night to meet with um, ECOWAS ambassadors that have been accredited to France. To France also, okay. So it, there was more than just one meeting. But now to answer your question more directly. Regarding the meeting with Minister Fabius, because we're talking both at a national and regional level, oh, yeah. at the regional level, the issue that came up was Ebola. Ebola. Because as I'm sure you would realize, whenever the media is covering the spread of the Ebola virus in our region, they say West Africa. West Africa. Well. They don't distinguish between the countries that have it and the countries that don't have it. It's in West Africa. In general. And so it was important to talk about, of course, the challenge that we have as West Africa, which we are aware of, because being the ECOWAS chair, being also the coordinating points, the logistics coordinating point for um, the Ebola um, outreach, and uh, at the same time, having recently hosted the um, West Africa Health Organization Conference for Ministers of Health, we are very much aware of the things that we are coordinating as a region to be able to deal with the virus. And it was important to point out that even though this is a very serious um, illness, the countries that have been infected have to be given the maximum support if they are going to be able to overcome it. Because when you look at Guinea and Liberia and Syria, Sierra. Leone, they are not the richest countries within the West Africa, Africa region. Yeah. They also didn't necessarily have the strongest healthcare systems. Yeah. And when you have a situation like Ebola, there are so many things that you've got to do at the same time. And so as much support as they can get to be able to treat the people who have been infected is important. Yeah. But for countries like ours that don't have it, our emphasis is on screening on public education, sure. on having the emergency preparedness so that in the event, and we certainly hope and pray that it doesn't happen, in the event that we were to get an infection, we would have a response. Another thing we talked about was peace and security within our region. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you've also heard about the increased terrorist activities of Boko Haram. Last year, we were dealing with the Malian crisis, crisis yeah. which is currently through going through a process of, if you like, mediation and reconciliation. Reconciliation, yeah. The Inter-Malian dialogue is currently ongoing in Algiers. Algiers. And it is, again, a matter in which West Africa has an interest. So we touched on that briefly as well. And then going forward, what the challenges would be? Because five of the countries in West Africa are heading for election next year. Next year, yeah. Nigeria, Togo, Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire, and, and Guinea Conakry. Conakry. Not Ghana. Ghana is 2016. Uh, 2016, yeah, yeah. Guinea Conakry. Guinea Conakry. And of course, elections and the contest that goes on during an elections, if not well managed, can always be a situation where there might be some instability. Instability. And so, of course, it's important to anticipate what could possibly go wrong 
and use preventive diplomacy to make sure that that doesn't happen. On the economic front, we talked about the Economic Partnership Agreement. Now that's the EPA. The EPA, mm -hmm. which the ECOWAS region has endorsed with um, uh, the European Union, European Union, and which we are looking to sign uh, soon. We also talked about the bilateral invest the investments that had taken place in Ghana from by French companies and the economic relationships that we had. And we also talked about how those relationships could be strengthened further. We are members of the Francophonie. There's going to be uh, an important uh, event conference taking place very soon in Dakar. We want to encourage the teaching of French language in Ghana because we are surrounded by Francophone countries. countries. And it's in our interest as we talk about accelerating integration to learn how to understand each, each other better. And all of these things came up in our meeting. Now, Madam, as we move on, let, let me also find out from you uh, specifics. I want, to, I want you to be specific on this issue for me. Under the Economic Partnership Agreement, which uh, West Africa or the ECOWAS countries have uh, adopted, what are some of the benefits that these countries are going to receive from the European Union, so far as the EPA is concerned? For, since the 70s, mm -hmm. the countries that were referred to as the ACP group, mm -hmm. African, Caribbean, Pacific, Pacific countries, countries yeah. benefited from access to the European market Markets. on a duty-free, quota-free basis. Quota basis. And that meant that exports coming from our countries, even where they were value-added exports, could enter the European market duty-free, quota-free. Quota -free. What, hap what happened specifically to Ghana over that period was that a number of European companies took advantage of that provision, and also Ghanaian companies, and invested in Ghana to create businesses that took advantage of the duty-free, quota-free market, market access. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we now refer to as our non-traditional export sector, processed wood products, canned tuna, pineapples, bananas, uh, horticultural products, all were able to build up their market share within the European Union as a result of this duty-free, quota-free access. Quota Where we are right now is that about 40% on the average, if you look at the last five years, about 40% of Ghana's exports come into the European Union and benefit from this duty-free, quota-free market access. Now, a couple of years ago, specifically around the year 2000, there, were, as there was agitation by countries that were not within the ACP group that Europe was treating its former colonies unfairly vis-à-vis oh, -vis the rest of the world. Because oh, most of the countries that were ACP were, as a matter of fact, former colonies of European states. states. And so countries in Latin America, countries in Asia, that were not in a position to benefit from this duty-free, quota-free market access, had difficulty competing with imports coming from the ACP group. And under the WTO rules, when you have a free trade agreement, it's supposed to be reciprocal. Okay. And so the last extension of this agreement, which we call the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, which allowed us to have duty-free access but didn't compel us to give the Europeans duty-free free access, access, was um, entered into in the year 2000 with the understanding that by 2008, we would have completed negotiations on an agreement that liberalized trade between the two regions, between the ACP group and the EU group. EU group. And it was decided that this time around, the negotiations for this free trade agreement would not take place across the whole ACP group, because that's Lat uh, African, Caribbean, and Pacific, Pacific countries, uh, countries, but would happen regionally, regionally, which is the reason why this negotiation now became, for us, us. An, a negotiation between ECOWAS. And I wanted to give you that background because if you think that 40% of our exports yes. are competitive vis-a-vis -vis exports coming to the European Union from Asia, from Latin America, America. because of the duty-free, quota-free quota -free market, market access, assets. that's our benefit. Okay. But what the agreement requires us to do is over a period of 20 years, 20 years. in five-year tranches, okay. so not all at once, in five-year tranches, we will also remove the tariffs, or in other words, remove the duties, on 75% of the product lines, not products, listen to me, 
product lines yeah. that are exported from Europe into West the West Africa region. Okay. Now, uh, as we move on also, I would like to t we'll talk about your meeting with Medef and Desian, as you have already said. You give us a very brief uh, history about uh, Medef and Desian. Will you give us, vividly, especially, what went on between you and the Medef and then the Desian, the group that you met as part of your meeting with the, uh, your coming to France? Well, in both cases. Yeah. Let's the, take the Medef first. I'll, I'll take both. Actually, it, well, there was a lot of similarity, so oh, okay. that's why I'm putting them together. Oh, okay, okay, okay. In both cases, these are businesses that either have invested in Ghana or want to invest in Ghana, and so they had specific questions they wanted to ask. Yes. Without exception, all of them wanted to know about Ebola and how it has impacted our economy. The economy. Of course, we have not had an incidence of Ebola, Ebola. in Ghana. Yeah, so it was that's right. I was able to confidently tell them that we don't have it. We put screening mechanisms in place. Of course, we hope that we don't get it, but we believe that we are taking the necessary preparatory measures so that we can deal with the situation if it occurs. But the emphasis is on preventing, you know, the situation from happening in the first place. Okay. Another issue that um, a number of them raised was to do with the financing of government projects. Mm -hmm. Because very often when you have um, companies that want to do infrastructure projects mm -hmm. and they are able to bring financing, mm -hmm. even if they are borrowing, they would like the government to have a guarantee, give a government guarantee. Guarantee. And it is our policy at the present time that we don't want to do that. The government won't, don't want to give guarantee to the, no. those things again. Because what happens is that even if we are not borrowing the money, mm -hmm. once we give a guarantee, if they don't pay, you are going to pay. But, and it also adds to our debt profile. Ah, okay. So when they say that our debt profile is X, Y, Z billions, it doesn't only include money that we have borrowed. borrowed. It also includes Guarantees. money that we have guaranteed. Okay. And so we believe that projects that can be self-financing and can generate significant returns should be able to borrow on their own balance sheets without a guarantee. Or for that matter, government institutions that are able to generate sufficient revenues, okay. for instance, like Ghana Ports and Harbors Port Authority, Authority, like Cocoa Board, should be able to borrow without a government guarantee. And we are encouraging more and more state institutions to do that so that, again, it helps us to lower our debt profile. So that was another matter that came up. Then, um, again, as I said, these are companies that have invested in Ghana. Yeah. So there were specific... Uh, uh, questions with regard to the capacity of Temaport, for instance, and what steps are being taken to expand because there's a certain amount of congestion. Mm -hmm. And from uh, Bolloré, they want to do a project with the government, which for which they will le look for financing, which will not require a guarantee, mm -hmm. to expand Temaport Port. in order to be able to facilitate more trade. The container terminal in Tema is a public-private partnership project already between the government and Bolloré. So if they were to do another project that further expands um, their facilities within Temaport, it is building on a project they've already implemented. They know that it has been a profitable project, and so it's something that they want to do um, going forward. Now, with your meeting with them, did anything come out with the acquisition of land in Ghana? Because most of them want to invest in Ghana, and then it uh, presumes that there are so many problems with land acquisition in Ghana. Uh, we hear about so many things, uh, land gas over here, land gas over there. Was a question like that being put to you about how the, most of the companies who want to invest in Ghana can freely acquire lands in setting up businesses in Ghana? No, there wasn't. But for instance, um the uh, company Fruitier, which in Ghana has invested under the name Golden Exotics Golden in Exotics. Kasunya, has taken uh, land to develop a banana and pineapple plantation. Mm -hmm. That was first land that belonged to Isuchari. Isuchari. Because remember, we had a sugar factory, factory, the factory in Isuchari. Isuchari. So Isuchari. once it became dysfunctional, it also had land, which was state land. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that that land could be leased and has now developed into a viable banana and pineapple oh. plantation. You know, it's been an example of where the fact that government has owned land has helped to facilitate the investment. But 
on the general issue of acquisition of land, mm -hmm. it's not just an issue of land guards. It's more an issue of title and being able to consolidate large tracts of land. Mm -hmm. The project that Golden Exotics is, is doing in Ghana, which has increased the export of bananas from Ghana to the European mm -hmm. Union mm -hmm. since um, 2008 by over 400%, all right, could be done on a thousand hectare plot of land because government owned that land. But if you are going to buy land from traditional authorities, it's not that easy to get such large acreages because typically you're going to have to negotiate with one with several chiefs to be able to, to get, get that the, size. The, the size yeah. So the challenge for us as a country, I think, and we need to work with our traditional authorities on these matters, is how we will encourage the creation of trusts, you know, yeah. traditional trusts that would own the land, which would have the land of a particular traditional area vested in that, so that it's easier to for prospective investors to acquire from a registered legal entity that has the title, therefore is in a position to give title and gives the security that will allow people to invest in projects of that nature. It has to be a bigger political discussion because it's not just a matter of government. government. It's an investment, or it's a matter of government and the traditional land, authorities. land owning authorities. But mm. it's an important discussion we have to have. Okay. Now, as you are the Minister for Foreign Affairs, we would like to uh, know from you, uh, as you came up as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, there have been a, you have set up the Diaspora the Support Bureau. Uh, I just want you to tell us, or the viewers, what exactly the Diaspora Support Bureau is going to do for Ghanaians in the Diaspora? Okay. When I arrived at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there was already a Diaspora Support Unit. Mm -hmm. It was a new unit that had been created for about a year. And what it was supposed to do was to provide, if you like, a point of contact for Ghanaians in the diaspora to be able to contact the ministry for issues that they wanted to have addressed. And typically, it had been relating to consular relations, mm -hmm. passports, uh, dual visas. citizenship, visas, regularization of documents, etc., etc. But I felt, and uh, more importantly, President Mahama felt, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs could be more proactive than that. That the Ghanaian community abroad is an important part of Ghana. But one of the challenges that we have had over time is making information about what government is doing available to the Ghanaian community on a regular basis, basis on demand and creating a point of call where if you wanted to have information on anything else going on in Ghana, you'd be able to contact the ministry through the Diaspora Support Bureau and do that. Now I know that the issues in the Ghanaian community don't only pertain to getting information. And I know that a good number of Ghanaians in the diaspora feel that because of the remittances they send home to family and friends, because remember that your remittances are not paid to the government. They are yeah. essentially sent home as investments that you are making in things of your choice. Of choice yeah. All right? They contribute to the economy and therefore should have a say in matters that are going on in Ghana. I don't think you are prevented from doing that but I think that the way that we can make that interaction more effective is important. And where we have embassies, like in France, where we have our embassy in Paris, it should be possible for you to engage more with the mission here and for the mission also to reach out to Ghanaians in other parts of France, outside of Paris, so that that interaction can take place and we can have discussions on a number of issues. Because on any matter, where we would want to change policy or law in order to create more opportunities for Ghanaians in the diaspora. It all starts with a conversation. It starts with stakeholder consultation. It starts with understanding what is possible and what is not possible. And it starts with finding out the best way we can get things done in order for that to happen. But until this time, we didn't really have an organized way of dealing with that. And so this is our response to that. Okay, come here. Uh, okay. My friend, my, my colleague will follow up with the follow up question. Minister, thank you so much. Uh, we would like to know as 
a Minister of Foreign Affairs, is there any measures put in place by your office to um, know a, a number of Ghanaians within a particular a country of the uh, jurisdiction of an embassy, Ghanaian embassy in a particular place? Do you have any measures put in place to know the number of the people? Well, we've asked our embassies previously to ask Ghanaians to register with the embassy because we can't know you unless you provide your information. But the truth of the matter is that because a number of uh, compatriots are not here with regular documents, they are suspicious about registering because they feel that somehow or the other, if that information is accessed, it can be to their detriment. So in, in other missions, you know, where they have actually embarked on this kind of exercise, they've had some response, but certainly they are aware that not all Ghanaians have responded. What we want to do is to encourage Ghanaians to make themselves known to the embassy, to register with the embassy, because God forbid, if there was a problem and we needed to reach out to you, if we don't know that you are here, France is a huge country. Sure. All right? Sure. With so many cities yeah. and with so many towns. If we don't know you are here, how are we expected to reach out to you? That's a problem. That, that's <laughs> why know? I think I was and, asking if and I'm the coming. embassies have so any, any measures put in place for that. You have to provide the information, but they have been asked to also obtain that information. I'll give you an example. When there was the crisis in Libya, yeah. when President Gaddafi was overthrown, you realized that we organized an airlift yeah. for Ghanaians to come back to Ghana. Yeah. It was at that point that we discovered how many Ghanaians were in Libya. Really? Because <laughs> now trouble had come. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted... Everyone they saw, is coming out from his bunker. They saw that the government was providing transport back home. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody was coming out to get back home. Mm. But because of the ad hoc nature of the provision of information about themselves, yeah. it made it difficult to plan for that operation and it became a very expensive operation. Okay. I'll give you another example. Recently, you've heard about the challenges in Ukraine and that there were Ghanaian students in Luhansk and uh, Donetsk who wanted to be evacuated. I remember when the matter came out in, in, in the media, I asked the acting head of mission in Moscow to go to Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, but to go to the two communities find out the number of Ghanaian students we had there so that if we needed to make plans to evacuate them we would be prepared. It took us quite a while to get the names and IDs of 136 Ghanaian students and what we said we wanted to do given their situation at the time was that we wanted to move them for two weeks into Kiev, the capital where there was no fighting, where we were going to rent hostels for them and feed them for the two-week period while we then made other arrangements to evacuate them. The initial reaction was that they were not going to come. Oh, really? Unless we guaranteed <laughs> that we were going to buy them air tickets. Wow. And we said, we're not ready to say that upfront because we're evaluating the situation. Sure. But we certainly want to move you out of harm's way. That's why we are taking the initiative to move you uh, to Kiev. As it turns out, two months later, they were now ready to take us up on the offer. And so we rented the hostels for them and we moved them to, to, to Kiev. But what also came out clearly was that they didn't want to leave because a lot of them were mid-studies. Yeah, okay. And so they rather wanted to see how it would be possible to transfer to other universities yes. to be able to continue yes. their courses and graduate. Otherwise, I think they felt it might be a bit difficult in view of the investments they had made. But these are much easier if you register, and all it requires you to do mm -hmm. is to come to the embassy, to introduce yourself to the head of chancery, okay. to say that I'm a Ghanaian citizen, this is my name, this is my passport, because once you came here, you must have come here on a travel document. Sure. All right? And somebody <laughs> come by see you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there's another category we are talking about, but you sure. must have some identification that shows you are a Ghanaian. Yeah so that we can register you with the embassy. We know who you are, we know your address and all of that. So that in the event of a challenge, it's possible to reach out to you. Okay. And then, Lisa, thank you so much. There are some non-Ghanians around holding Ghana passports and 
from our checks. They were acquired them back home in Ghana before they even entered into France and the other countries around. So how is your office trying to curb this situation? You see, that's a, a problem we have with passports generally because if you've applied for a passport, you know that we ask for your birth certificate. Yeah. We ask for guarantors. We ask for information to be able to substantiate that you are a Ghanaian. Yeah. And if on the face of it, you have all of this documentation, how can the passport office legitimately deny you a passport? All right, because you might say that, well, he doesn't speak with a guy. Ghanaian accent. Yeah. But some of you have children here in France who don't speak any Ghanaian language. Yes, of course. All right? Yeah. Because they've been born here and they've grown up here. Yeah, exactly. If for one reason or the other they went back to Ghana and they were applying for a Ghanaian passport and they were speaking English with a French accent, yeah. is that enough reason to say they are not Ghanaian? Yeah, but a lot of them from Nigeria and the neighboring countries who are acquiring the passports before they enter here. So. It's not case. But the point is still remains. You see, the, the reason why I was drawing the example is this. We, and it's not a lot. There, have be, there are some. I agree with you, there are some who fall through the cracks. But the point is, if someone has all the documentation, all the necessary requirements. has Ghanaians that are ready to act as guarantors for them, yeah. who say, I, th I know this guy, he's a Ghanaian. Yeah, okay. All right? He's my relative. He has been in my church. He's so and so and so. And all of that comes with the passport application. How can the director of passports refuse, refuse to give him a passport? Yeah, so, so that means the so, office is so, very much aware of these so, problems. So what we want to do yeah. is that, you know, currently we are issuing the biometric passports. And by October of 2015, we are going to phase out the handwritten passports. Yeah. The biometric passports we are using, together with the information we are requesting for, contains a certain data set. Once we have finished this particular batch of booklets, because we have about 800,000 passport booklets in stock, we now want to upgrade our passport with more enhanced security features, and we also want to require additional information in order to be able to cross-check or to have more checks to ascertain your Ghanaian nationality before we give you the Ghanaian passport. Because the only way that we can deal with this is to expand the references that we require in order to ascertain that someone is a Ghanaian. Yeah. But we don't want to do it in such a way that for genuine Ghanaian citizens, we make it so cumbersome that it takes you three, four weeks to go around looking for documentation before you can apply for a passport. Because the, in all of this, you have to balance yeah. between the security challenge of making sure you don't give passports to people who are not entitled yeah. and making it, asking for things that are so unreasonable mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of data you want people to provide yeah. that it makes people who are genuinely Ghanaian, you know, it makes it difficult for them to get passports. For instance, we know that a, a good number of our communities are rural. Sure. And in those communities, not everybody at birth was issued with a birth certificate. <laughs> so if we were to say, don't only produce your birth certificate, but your parents' birth certificate, that before, will be, uh, it will be a problem. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. But that might be another check to put in place to make sure that you are Ghanaian. So that's why I said, when we are thinking of the additional information required in the data fields. We don't want to do it in such a way that people who are genuinely entitled will find it too difficult to, to, to get, or might even have to fake documents in order to be able to That's access passport. a passport. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> But finally, um, I would like, a book has been um, introduced by Honorable Michael Osei Mensah, um, actually calling on the ministry to um, establish or open um, uh, foreign offices for various uh, um, in the various countries for the diasporans. How are you going to? Will you be able to, to set up for for the people? Because at least they will be having a representatives in the four um, various countries to at least help them coordinate with the government. Well, 
<coughs> it's a good idea, but it's all a function of government's resources and ability to do this. Really? Yes, because you see, maintaining a mission, mm -hmm. renting residences, renting houses for our people who will be posted to work in the missions, paying for their upkeep, is all about money. Yeah. All right? You give remittances, but you don't pay taxes. Sure. <laughs> 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 and, it is, and it is tax revenue that contributes to government's ability to run these offices. Mm. And let me just give you an example, because a lot of people don't see it that way. But before I do that, let me be more specific. I think it's a good idea, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's an idea we can implement at the present time, mm -hmm. given the constraints we have to deal with. Okay. And that's what I want to elaborate on. Last time, when we had the election, how many people, to your knowledge, registered to vote? 14 million. Okay. Yeah, there about. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you know that less than a million people are registered with SNIT, the Social Security and National Insurance yeah, Trust, the National Pension Fund? And why is this figure important? Because it gives you an indication of Ghanaians who are in formal employment. The operative word here is formal, formal employment. employment yeah. Because remember that the SNIT law requires all employers sure. to contribute on behalf of their employees sure. to SNIT. So the employee contributes, the employer contributes. So if we had 14 million adults registering to vote, and we have less than a million people in formal employment, and therefore that number of people paying income tax, and then you have other government revenue raised through VAT, raised through customs duties, then what is, is clear, just by putting out those numbers, is that not everybody is contributing towards the development of the country. And so that's the reason why government resorts to so much indirect taxation. Mm -hmm. Because unlike the, how you work here in France, where all of you have tax deducted from your, your incomes, so, yeah. our system at the present time, though we are improving it, but our system at the present time doesn't allow for that. It's only government workers who pay the direct taxes. People in formal Formal's employment, sector. because there are people also who work in the private sector. Okay. After all, most of the banks are not state-owned banks. Okay. But the people are in formal employment, the and they pay SNIT. That's why I used the statement formal employment, employment, not government employment. So what we are able to do as a government in terms of financing the operations of the government machinery, financing projects, is a function of the revenue we are able to raise. Whether it is a question of having more staff here to be able to service uh, the Ghanaian diaspora community better, mm -hmm. whether it's a question of establishing consulates even in other big cities where we have larger Ghanaian communities so they don't have to travel all the way to Paris. Yeah, Paris. It's a reflection of our, our resources and at the current time we're not in a position to do that. But as we continue to grow and we improve, I think it's definitely an idea that can be considered in the future. Thank you, Ms. Madam. Madam, uh, this is uh, the last question that I want to ask you. Even though you are not um, the Minister for Finance, uh, the, this is a very a good news that we have heard, that Ghana trying to um, so secure the euro bond, one billion euro bond, has been able to secure 2.9 billion. Then also, Ghana Cocoa Board is going to receive 1.2 billion euros, that is 1.7 billion dollars for the coming season. Uh, how, how, how do you take this as a, as a minister for uh, government? We didn't uh, get 2.9 billion from the no. bond. It was oversubscribed. Subscribe. Yeah, yeah, that's what, but that's as a matter that. of fact, what we wanted was oh, 1 billion. Was 1 billion. Yeah. So to the extent that there's that much investor interest mm -hmm. in the euro bond yeah. that we were issuing, I think it's a great development because it shows that there's confidence in our economy. Right. Now, with regard to the Coco. the syndicated uh, loan that was um, mm -hmm. signed yesterday mm -hmm. for the purchase of Coco, Coco, again, it's an indication of what the market anticipates for our Coco crop. Coco. Because if it wasn't, we didn't have that much Coco that we were looking to buy, and there weren't good prospects for the market in terms of being able to sell and recover the money, that facility wouldn't be made available. So. Last year we had a drop in cocoa prices. This year cocoa prices have picked up. Not only have they picked up, the anticipated production for the year is also more than last year. 
which is great because all of this gives an indication that we will get more revenue into the system, into the system yeah. which will allow us to do a lot more for many more Ghanaians. Thank you very much, Madam Hannah Tete, Minister for Foreign Affairs. We are very grateful to have you on Rejoice TV, which is also a real good channel. Oh, okay, Madam Hannah Sewatete. A lot of people wonder how I got that name. My grandmother, my yeah. father's mother, yeah. his name was Hannah Sewa. Oh, okay. And so he named me after her. Oh, okay. So that's how come my name is Hannah Sewatete. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving us the history of your name about your name. We are most grateful to have you on Rejoice TV, a channel on Iroko TV.